please welcome the Reverend Amy Heller. Welcome to my living room. <laughs> We're so delighted to be gathered this evening and to welcome Omar, Nancy, and uh, Chris, who doesn't need a welcome here. This is really his living room. Um, but I wanted to make sure with all of the information in the bulletin that you also were aware that Omar is the president of the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research, which is um, a big part of where you spend all your time and energy, too. So. We're so delighted to be gathered. And do take advantage of the texting. I've got my phone ready to go for your questions. So I feel like this is 2.0 after last year, <laughs> and I wanna get us um, a little deeper into the connectivity and some of the ways that we are similar and different. Um, and so we'll just begin. What's one belief or practice that each of your faith traditions has in common? Okay, I'll You're start. The um, we all mark time. Mm. We all distinguish between mundane time, regular time, and holy time. And I think that um, it's sort of the essence of the religious path is to make distinctions, to um, create boundaries, um, and by designating those times that leads to a whole life of celebration, of mourning, of um, birth and death, of um, the rituals that we do. So I think we all, we all have that in common. We do it a little bit differently, but. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, I would say uh, Abraham, mm. peace be upon him. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's often funny to me when we talk about the Abrahamic faiths, but we don't talk about Abraham. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that getting back to the person of Abraham, peace be upon him, and I go back to him, and, and he's always someone that I felt a deep connection to. And I wonder, you know, at, this was a man who faced the rejection of his people, including his own family, and now is claimed by the majority of the world. <laughs> mm. Um, and I think it's profound. And one of the things that uh, in, in the Quran, Abraham is, where actually the word Muslim is traced to Abraham, peace be upon him. The word Muslim, Islam means peace through submission. And a Muslim is one who attains peace through submission. And therefore Abraham, peace be upon him, being the hallmark of submission and attaining peace therein, whether he was in a fire that he was thrown into by his father or whether he was commanded to sacrifice his son, that submission and the peace that he attained therein uh, is something that we as Muslims are called to. So I think that if we go back to the person of Abraham, peace be upon him, and his calling and uh, his theology, his, his being, then we, we can find a lot of commonality. And I often, I think we've said this before, that uh, Judaism and Islam theologically share a ton in common, for example, where even the terminology at times will come up. So I remember uh, speaking to a rabbi and the word korbani came up, which is the sacrifice. It's the same word in Arabic and in Hebrew that you come near to God uh, through sacrifice. A lot of the terminology, a lot of the theology uh, is very similar. And there's, you know, the way we view covenant and scripture and, and salvation. And then and obligation and too. obligations, correct, rituals. So there's a lot of similarity between the creeds and between Islam and Judaism. And then uh, with Islam and Christianity, uh, uh, the person of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, uh, that there's a lot in common there. So when we build off of, you start with Abraham, and then I think it's important for us to build uh, after that with, with our partners. I think it's a hard question only because there's so many answers. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that we share. I guess for me, the obvious one is prayer. We all pray, and we have specific ways of praying. Each branch of our respective traditions have unique ways of praying, and it's taken very seriously. And perhaps it's a sliding scale of how seriously that's taken. Mm -hmm. But prayer definitely roots us. We have that spiritual experience when we do it. And I think in all three traditions, at least, at least in some way, there's a physicality of prayer 
that does manifest itself and is important. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just follow up on that with that sense of each tradition has a sense of direction in prayer. Can you mm -hmm. reflect on that based on each tradition? Why, why do we face a certain way? Why are, why are our uh, holy places, holy sites situated in, in directional meaning? Um, so <laughs> in Christianity, East is important. Often churches are oriented such that congregations are praying toward the east. Mm -hmm. You're not in one of those places. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. It's true. Um, however, east is still very important. And, and for us, facing east is... Is, is not critical, right? I, I don't think anyone, I don't think any Christian traditions, out, except Eastern Orthodox traditions, um, the Orthodox traditions tend to place uh, facing East in prayer actually quite significantly. The other Christian groups don't really make East that important, but there is scriptural backing for that. There are multiple examples, particularly in the New Testament, where there are references to resurrection and the second coming and the Son of Man returning, all from the East. And so it's very traditional that worship spaces would be oriented toward the East, I suppose out of respect, and I also suppose maybe just in case it happens when you're in church, you're facing the right direction. <laughs> okay. um, so I think actually the facing East part um, the Jewish tradition is probably responsible Same. for. <laughs> I give you um, credit. In, in, there are references to it in the Hebrew scriptures as well, in Chronicles and in um, First Kings, to face God's house. And, of course, um, the temple was built in... in well, it's only east if you're in the west, right? It depends where you are. <laughs> so, so do you, depending on where you are in the world, is it yes. really face Jerusalem? Yes, toward Jerusalem, yes. So that's and if you're you in common. Jerusalem, you face toward the Temple Mount, and if you're at the Temple Mount, you face toward the um, Holy of Holies. You get as cl you, you face as, you, you keep trying to face where God is supposed to reside. I mean, we know that God resides everywhere, but, um, but this, is a, um, this is a way of, of orienting oneself toward God. And let me just say that um, even though this is very important in Jewish tradition, Temple Emmanuel right up the road, uh, the first prayer space where the ark faces east is the newest one just built about three years ago. All the other ones face <laughs> other, other directions. So, you know, but... Um, I think it's... Inter you know, I was thinking about, you know, the, there's a historical reason for, for facing east, being uh, facing toward the holiest place. But... I also think about the name Jerusalem, where we face, um, and that name means the heritage, the multiple heritages, and it's a name that is a plural name. The word Yerushalayim in Hebrew is in the plural, and I think that in a way one could say that the inclination to, to face in that direction has nothing to do with the uh, land. What it has to do with is the idea that God is a plurality and that God belongs to everyone and that, as it says in Isaiah, my house shall be a house for all peoples. And so there is a m sort of messianic uh, aspect to facing the Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, the Holy of Holies. Well, if anyone would like to uh, come to a place that's always been facing east, <laughs> <laughs> Valley, Valley Ranch Islamic Center. <laughs> uh, we, we always face east. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but, but the story of the, the prayer direction for us is, um, I think it adds another dimension. So uh, initially, 
with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Muslims actually faced Jerusalem in their prayer direction. And so the Holy Kaaba, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, the Kaaba would be placed in Mecca. The Prophet, peace be upon him, would face the Kaaba while also facing towards the direction of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And it's literally called Al-Quds, Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa, which is the Holy Land uh, to us. So initially they faced in that direction and that continued for the first 14 plus years of, his, uh, of, of the 23 year mission of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when they were persecuted and run out to Medina, um, a revelation came in the Quran that they would face Mecca in their prayer direction. Um, and there's something very profound about that unity of prayer direction. For one, um, I get asked sometimes, do Muslims worship the black box? Do they worship mm -hmm. the Kaaba? And the answer is no, and it was never understood that way. It was never understood to actually be an object to be worshipped, but rather it unites us in a prayer direction that that is the place that Abraham established a home, uh, built a house with his son Ishmael, uh, peace be upon him, uh, for God to be honored and worshipped. So it unites us in direction in obligatory prayer. Uh, so in congregational prayer, in our obligatory prayers, we must face that direction. Uh, for the voluntary prayers, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would even pray on the back of a horse or on the camel facing towards any direction. The sense of uniting us in direction, uh, you know, when, when Malcolm X went to Hajj, when he went to Mecca, uh, he, he recognized something very powerful, that you cannot experience true unity as a people until you experience a sense of unity of purpose. So the idea of, of circling around the Kaaba, placing God at the center of your life, not believing that God is constrained to, a, to, to that place of worship, but rather people of all races, white, black, yellow, brown, uh, circling around, praying in one direction, wearing the same clothes, treating each other as, as, as human beings, all as the creation of God, fosters a great sense of unity. So it unites us in prayer in our direction, and it is our direction uh, as, as Muslims, when we're buried, we're buried facing. Our faces face towards Mecca as well. So it's sort of you, you remain longing uh, for God no matter where you are. You're always sort of faced in that direction. That's great. Um, so since we've stumbled into sacred writing, Torah, scripture, Quran, um, talk about how law forms community in your tradition. Um, and you can feel free to reflect on a specific teaching or in, in general, but at the basis of all faiths is a sense of God's law. I guess I'll start that one. Um, the Quran is called a light, uh, and it's called healing in, in the Quran. The Quran is very different as a sacred scripture because we view it as the word of God himself. Uh, the beauty of the Quran, in, and there are many things that are beautiful about it, uh, but it's pronounced and read the exact same way over 1,400 years throughout the world. Mm -hmm. So when you, you, a Muslim in Kenya recites it the same way as a Muslim in Beijing recites it the same way as a Muslim in Texas. And there isn't a Texas accent to the Quran. You just, <laughs> you just, <laughs> you just recite it. But sometimes you could hear the accent, but every pronunciation is maintained um, to its perfection. It's a science of how to pronounce the words and the letters of the Quran. So that unified text, that same sacred scripture that's been preserved over 1400 years, and we look at it as the word of God himself. But I find it interesting, it's described as a light. And what makes light powerful is that it's manifest itself and it manifests everything around it. So it makes things clear around you. And the description of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was as a walking Quran. He was the, he was the, the, the uh, his wife described him that way actually, that he practiced what he preached, that if you wanted to see the themes of the Quran of mercy, of love, of justice, uh, of, of worship and devotion, first and foremost to that, to that one God, then you saw it in his person. And so in, in, in a way you ask yourself, how do I become a light to someone else? Uh, so the Quran is definitely not just meant to be inspirational, it's meant to be instructional, it is uh, as a community, we're called to be Ahlul Qur'an in Arabic, which are people of the Qur'an. And a question that I think we have to ask ourselves when we talk about sacred scripture is, what does your scripture look like embodied today in your context? And I think that's where the disconnect is often found. We see sacred scripture abused all the time. We see it used to torture, to punish, to... Uh, to terrorize, to do all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, when, when uh, Jeff Sessions quoted the Bible, 
to justify the family separation policy. Um, it took Christians to come out and to reclaim the Bible and to say, no, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible lifts up this. And so as a Muslim, for example, I would say to my community, you know, one of the first verses of the Quran actually condemned a practice in Arabia which was to bury the daughters alive because girls were in, in a desert, harsh desert climate. They were looked at as being a liability, not as a value, and so they used to practice female infanticide. And one of the first verses of the Quran was, when the young girl who was killed unjustly is asked, for what crime were you killed? And so what I would challenge my community with is, how can you read that verse and not make the connection with Jacqueline, whose picture was broadcast all over, the young girl from Guatemala who suffered, who died for no crime that she committed. So we have to make those connections between our sacred scripture and our very unsacred times, you know, sometimes, and, and, and ask ourselves, how do we become light in the darkness? How do we actually reflect that scripture and embody it in our dark times? I see law in the Christian tradition is not, well, I think Christian leaders often create sets of laws around Scripture when, I think very clearly, Jesus says the law is not what will save you. And part of what I think we have to strive to do is reckon that message with our human need for structure, you know, we need some structure around us, some parameters, some expectations put around how we behave. And that's where I think a lot of Christian churches can get off the rails is when they perhaps extrapolate that idea a little too far and they think they know just a little too clearly what Jesus was saying. Because you know, I had someone once say that theology was developed in order to make something simple very complicated, or else we'd actually have to do it. And so you know, mostly what we get in the Christian tradition from Jesus is you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself. Like that's, there's your parameter. That's so broad and that is so open that we immediately say, then how? And it's at that moment that we can get in trouble. And I think a lot of times what leaders will do is they will run that down so far and so finite that they've taken away all the opportunity for God to be there. And that's when you get communities that act out of fear and act out of desperation and begin to draw conclusions that actually hurt people hmm. when clearly that was not the intention. But we're human, and because we don't necessarily, we inherited, obviously, a brilliant, complex legal tradition from the Jewish people, but it was remade in a way that opened up almost too much interpretation, and too many Christians don't know what Scripture says. So when they hear someone say, Scripture says X, then they just kind of go with it because they don't know the difference. And I think that it's our job, it's incumbent upon us to really ground ourselves in what it says so that we know. You can't just pick a verse out of some book to prove something you like. Too simple. You've got to see the big picture. And of course, for Christians, everything goes through the lens of Christ. And so if something in Scripture seems to go against the essence of Jesus, well, Jesus wins. And we have to, I mean, we just have to start there. And these other human people who were great, good, faithful people are not Jesus. And we don't have a Scripture that we believe is literal words of God. And so everything that we have, whether they be letters or stories written by good human people, although inspired, still go through the lens of Christ. So if I may, go. Uh, this is, this is uh, for the sake of conversation. Um, 
And it's actually not a pushback, but just to further elaborate, uh, I think that the issue is the subjectivity of the lens at times, right? And so an Islamic understanding, sort of what you mentioned about Jesus wins. The, the Quran is actually not a very thick book. It's right. 600 pages, but it's not, it's not a very expansive book. Um, the prophetic example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, guards the interpretation of the Quran, if you will. So it's not, uh, so, so if you want to know how the Quran is to be understood, you look at the person of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then if you want to understand the person of the Prophet, peace be upon him, you look to his companions, which are the, his, his family, his companions, which are sort of the equivalent of the disciples. The idea is that uh, a lot of times when fighting extremist interpretations, you take it back to the original intent from an Islamic perspective, and you say, well, that's not how the Prophet understood the verse, and that's not how the early Muslims understood that verse. And that's a way of actually um, pushing away interpretations that are unfounded and baseless. And I think one of the great challenges of theology is to almost resist uh, the constant changing times around them while still paying attention to them, not becoming, religion can't become stagnant, it can't become unreasonable, it can't become, um, you know, it, it cannot become a source of anxiety for people, but it still has to, true religion has to find a way to resist societal pressure to where honest conversations can still be had, but you can't ignore societal issues. You gotta pay attention to your problems, you gotta pay attention to the issues, you gotta pay attention to how people are interacting with scripture. But I, I think that's, that's probably a great challenge that we all, we all will face with ourselves is, you know, what is the lens, right? And, and how, do we, how do we actually maintain integrity as religious scholars, as theologians? How do we really maintain an honest discussion about what these texts in, were intended to mean as opposed to just becoming tools for us to where we use them how we find convenient as opposed to what was true to the intent of those revelations? And I like the idea of you almost have concentric rings down to the core and, you know, for us, you, you start with Jesus and then you kind of go out to his apostles. And then you've got people who were then students of those people. And you also have the tradition that comes in there. And if things are pretty good, then, yeah, take, take all of that. There are plenty of op moments when agreement occurs. But then you get, I mean, you brought it up, you get someone like Jeff who pulls a quote from Romans and says, then we can do this that is very destructive and very hurtful. You know, I heard that and I thought, listen, I'm not a lawyer, but you just got in my lane. And so <laughs> that is not what that means. Right. And if, you, if we need to, as a, as a mode of argument, say, well, that's not the most center ring, right? So Paul, good guy. He, tried hard, and he wrote good stuff, and still can make a mistake, or wrote something very specific for a specific group of people trying to answer their questions to help them be faithful. We can't then just cherry pick a thing out written by one person for one group of people 2,000 years ago and say, that is exactly what we do. Hmm. Go beyond that and go deeper. And what was the inspiration? and What was the essence of that writing? So that it still makes sense today. Because that relevancy is very helpful. You know, I think, I think too many people think that religion is static. You've got this finished document and the end. And then everything else that comes after that is just some kind of, I don't know, it, we ignore perhaps demands of today. Right. When there are plenty of things about today that could not have been foreseen. Right. And so we've, it is, we are called upon to make those interpretive decisions, but not at the, not in order, eh, what do I want to say? We cannot sacrifice the most fundamental intent right. of what those writings were meant to convey. Right. A lot to uh, process here, but I, you know, um, this is something else I think that we all have in common, although we don't always recognize it because we do it differently in each of our traditions. But, um, you know, the Torah, the Hebrew scripture, is called 
the law, often translated as the law, um, but really what, the, what Torah means is teaching, and it also comes from the root or, which also means light. Mm. So, and I, so the scripture is really about, um, is a, it's a textbook, it's a um, opportunity for contemplation, for wisdom, for enlightenment. Um, and within it, of course, there are lots of different examples of um, judgment. We, so we also have another word, deen, which means judgment, which also sometimes gets translated as law. It's probably the closest thing we have. We have lots of examples of that. And we also have lots of examples of rachamim, of mercy. And as we go out in those, we go from you know Torah out to the concentric circles, of um, the, so we call Torah the oral law, it was given orally, then we go to the Talmud, which is called the written law, and if you, um, and, and it's, there's an intermediary step, but it's all trying to make sense of the examples in the textbook, in the Torah, that are there, and what does this mean for what I'm going through now in my context, in my time period? And that process continues uh, throughout, the, and it, it continues to this day. We still have something called responsa, where if there's a question that has to do with Jewish law, what to do in a certain kind of situation, someone can write to a group of rabbis and, or, or a rabbinic authority and get the sort of history of where this has come down, but I think ultimately the main thing is that law becomes a case-by-case -case process. It is not one law for all time. Mm. It is, it is, context is important and um, motive is important and lots of things are taken into account um, to try to create an equitable uh, society. One of the issues that rabbis and scholars deal with in, in, our, in the continuation of our sacred texts is that balance between what's called deen, the judgment law, and rachami, mercy. And um, the rabbis say in several different places in uh, in interpretive law, in interpretive texts, that God actually always prays that God's mercy will supersede God's judgment, and that there will be an opening of hearts and minds. And I think about, you know, what, we, what do we try to do as parents? Obviously, we all have to have rules and laws and, and um, expectations and ways of doing things that create the, the framework for a life. And we want our children to follow those. And at the same time, we want them to know that no matter what, even when they don't follow them, which they are, like we are bound not to, we're human and we do that. Even, even God does that, right? We see examples in our scripture. I don't know about yours. In ours, God's, you know, not um, always making, the right choices, but you know, we, we hope that our sense of love for our children, that our children will feel that love even when we're trying to get them to do what we think is the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of the idea of law within Judaism, that the, the, the love is always there. We don't talk about it as much as Christians, um, but we have it. That's the underlying expectation um, that God loves every single one of us unconditionally, and at the same time, there are there there's a way to live life that um, we learn from our history, from our scripture, from our tradition. So um, I think a lot of the terms you used, Dean, is a term we have as well. Uh, Rahma is mercy, so it's, it sounds very similar. 
you know, with Islam, last, last year we had, the, we went into like a deep theological tangent about the infallibility of the prophets and whether prophets were infallible and capable of making mistakes and making the wrong choices. So from a Muslim perspective, God does not err. He cannot make mistakes. He cannot make the wrong choices. That he has an all-encompassing time, uh, all en all-encompassing wisdom. He knows what comes next. And so he acts in accordance with that. So there's a departure there. I think that what, what, what happens in Islam is that there's this, there's this intention to preserve the consistency of the creed across the prophets and across times, that the creed should remain the same and creed is not subject to changing times, that divinity, salvation, questions of, questions of the essence of God and the essence of scripture should remain across the prophets, remain across all times, and that should be maintained. And then when it comes to law, there are laws that are across all times as well. And then there are laws that are organic, and that's where the word jurisprudence comes, fiqh. So jurisprudence is meant to be organic. It's meant to take into consideration changing times. And the balancing act in Islam is the letter and the spirit of the law without sacrificing either one. So for example, if the letter of a particular law cannot be applied in a particular context because it would contradict the spirit of that law, then the letter remains, but the injunction would be suspended on the basis that what this means in our time, what legal scholars would say in our time this means is something different and we have to maintain the maqasit. So in Islam, uh, we, we have... have is there, this yes, the word? So, yeah, it's the same. So the word uh, uh, sharia, don't get scared. Um, <laughs> Uh, there, sometimes it's like, you know, I gotta, I, I have to, when I say the word sharia, you think of, <laughs> I'm not even going to say what Stop. you think of. I won't yeah, project, yeah. So, uh, the word uh, sharia, which would mean the way, the overarching way, uh, which, in, which actually means a path to water. So, a path to, a path to guidance, a path to water. So, there's the overarching way, and the way that fiqh jurisprudence is described is that the particular injunctions and jurisprudence. And this is really interesting because there's a whole science over time called maqasid. Maqasid meant what were the objectives of the law. And in Islam, the objectives of sharia, which by the way doesn't mean law, surprise, surprise, sharia never meant law. Uh, and it certainly did not mean uh, the law of Saudi Arabia. Um, but the objectives of sharia, which are the, the, which are the ways, the overarching principles and ethics are five. The preservation of religion, uh, the preservation of life, the preservation of intellect, the preservation of property, the preservation of honor. And so everything operates under that sense of preservation and then the particulars are interpreted in light of those, uh, in light of preserving the, the ethics that were behind uh, those, those particular injunctions. And we have different categories in Judaism, but halakha is also the way, right? right? It's, it, it's also often translated as law, another word that's right. translated as law. But it technically, you know, from the root means the way. How do you live right. your life? How do you progress? Right. Well, I'm going to uh, question from the gallery. Sure. So, uh, question saying, does your religion encourage non-believers or non-members to convert? and uh, follow your faith? If so, how does one go about doing that? How does one become a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim? There is a, a beautiful verse in the Quran called there's no, that says there's no compulsion in religion. Mm -hmm. La ikraha fid deen. Well, the beauty of that verse, la ikraha fid deen, there's no compulsion in religion, is that was actually revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was the head of state in Medina. So it was not revealed as, as uh, some Islamophobes would suggest when the Muslims were weak and they were kind of like, don't force us into your religion of polytheism. It was revealed uh, actually when the Muslims were in a place of power to uphold the right uh, of, of religious minorities to practice their religion properly. Uh, Islam believes, I, now obviously that's not how it, it gets filtered throughout history. There are people that abuse their religion. There are people that persecute religious minorities, past, present, and I think that's true for I mean, Christians never persecuted religious minorities, but, you know, um, <laughs> no, Muslims, Christians, the point is, is that people are people, and we've said this, right, that there would be people that would abuse power and that would persecute religious minorities, but technically speaking, Islam has a tradition of legal pluralism, where uh, it was a group rights model, where uh, under the Ottomans, for example, they had what's called the millet system, the Christians practiced their religion, they had their churches, 
without, being, without having religion forced upon them. Uh, the Jews practiced their religion with their synagogues, with their scripture, with their own laws. Who actually, and so it's legal pluralism. The rabbi or the, the, the priest or whoever it would be would report back to the, uh, to the Islamic courts. And so it was meant to be that way, to preserve that sense of everyone's right to their own faith. And interestingly enough, as Islam went into Iraq and Persia, uh, it was not the dominant religion for hundreds of years. Zoroastrianism was, because there was an understanding that we can't force, even with the rule of those places, we can't force people to abandon their religion. Uh, religion, is, religion is meant to be a relationship between a person and God, not between two people. So taking away a person's right to determine their own beliefs, to come to their own conclusion about God, is the most ungodly thing that you could do. And so there's no compulsion in religion. And in Islam, we do believe in conveying the message. So we have a principle, convey, don't convert. We convey, balligh, you give the message of Islam to people. But you don't force it upon anybody, whether you're in a place of power or otherwise, you are meant to convey the message of Islam to people. That's great. Thank you. So, um, you know, Judaism is, in its origin, meant only for the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So it's very clear, and that's not to say that that, um, that would be the only religion, but it's very clear that there's room for people to find their way to God without being Jewish. And um, we have, you know, there's, a, there's a, an understanding of the laws that particularly, that apply to everyone that are called the Noahide laws. There are seven laws that apply to everyone and the, the other um, 605 in the Torah are for the Jews. So lucky us. So anybody who wants to come and, con and convert to Judaism, um, you know, and, and the truth is that um, for, for most of Jewish history, it was, um, not encouraged to convert. There was a lot of dissuasion of conversion. And it's unclear how much of that was theological and how much of that was because we could get killed by Christians if we tried it. But <laughs> honestly, you know, there was a little of each of those. And, uh, and, and Jews and Muslims coexisted for over a thousand years very well. Yeah. It was the Christians that caused us a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. There are just more of I just you. thought I'd, I just just, thought I'd as, add in. As we just, see, <laughs> the more there are of us, the more variations and uh, extreme um, interpretations we get. So there are more of you, so yeah, yeah. we'll give you a break. But um, we, won't call, we, won't, we won't hold you accountable. But um, <laughs> yeah, so, so yes, you may convert to Judaism. The reform movement in particular has become very encouraging of people who want to explore Judaism. Um, it's a long process of uh, getting to know what the Jewish people is, which is a little unique in terms of its, um, you know, there are, there are aspects of Judaism that are very hard to replicate or um, uh, participate in without being born into it, and so, um, but there are also aspects of Judaism that people who are born into it never appreciate or end up um, expressing. So we, we see, especially in the reform movement, that our, um, our faith has been really enriched by people who've chosen to become Jewish. I would say for Christians, there's definitely a historical shift over time. The first few centuries, it was not explicitly evangelical. Mm. I would say it was very much like a convey, not convert. Uh, they were excited and they, they loved what they had found. And so people wanted some of that. Mm. And I think that that was really attractive and that began to multiply. When Rome got involved, that's when stuff shifted. So blame and Rome, right? That's... When in Rome. So, you know, we, we often refer to that as the problem of Constantine, is once Rome got involved with Christianity, made it first legal and then official of the empire, it got too connected. Uh -huh. And I would say, you might even call it too politicized or secular for, for that period of time. And then it's ebbed and flowed since then. But I think there's no way around 
identifying Christianity as a more conversion-centric tradition, a more evangelical tradition. And that's certainly what most Christians understand. Uh, we talk, or I, I like to talk a lot about the difference between an inherited faith and a chosen faith. And I kind of like what Nancy was saying in the sense that when you inherit a faith, you take a lot of things for granted. When you choose a faith, then you really understand its essence. You are excited about it. I think you actually change the way you live, which by the way is the point. And that makes a much bigger impact yeah. on your life. Um, and I cannot help, but this is completely, you know, I shouldn't even talk about this, but um, one of my favorite scenes in Sex and the City, because I love that. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite scenes is when Charlotte York, who is a very good Episcopalian, decides she has fallen in love with a Jewish man. And he will not marry someone who's not Jewish. And so, of course, she decides that she's going to become Jewish then because she loves this man. And so she puts on her pearls and she bakes a basket of muffins and puts them in and she trots herself down to the synagogue and she knocks on the door and the rabbi answers the door and she says, hello, I'm Charlotte Gork and I want to become Jewish. And he looks at her. He says, we're not interested. <laughs> but that is so, that's it. Oh, well. That's it. No. There you go. That would not happen. Yeah. <laughs> In Dallas, Texas. I thought, I thought we were going to, we agreed back there to do football analogies. <laughs> yeah, sorry, this sorry. Is, you took this, this to the rails. This is definitely yeah. more Can we, my uh, Yeah, this is rails. not, you just took this to another What's level. What's your favorite scene from Sex and the City? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't say I have one, so next question. <laughs> next question. Um, another one, another question, another question from the gathering. Um, so the discussion this evening seems to be focused on the roots of each faith and how it informs and lives now. So how do these religions, how do your faith traditions see the future? Where are we going? And I would add in here to this question, knowing that we are a single global community and all the pressures that come with that um, and what challenges us mm. as a global community, climate, all the resources we share are codependent on. Um, how do, where's religion, where's your religion's voice and place in that um, for the future? So. Well, I can, I mean, I think that there are two, like everything else in our world today, there's a polarization, right? There are, mm -hmm. you know, the Jews who think we've got to just batten down the hatches, protect what we've got, build our walls, um, you know, strengthen our, our, our coffers and, you know, just get ready and, and to, to survive in really tough times. And there are others who say, you know, there's no way that that's going to ultimately lead to um, survival, that we really need to be spending our time and effort and resources uh, enhancing our relationships with other groups and not not becoming other groups, mm. but certainly doing things like we're doing tonight where we um, get to know each other better, we get to trust each other, and we work together to mutually combat things that would mitigate against our ability to live out our faith uh, peacefully, healthily, uh, in, in an inclusive way in the world. Demographically speaking, we are going to shift in a very significant way in the next 80 to 100 years, specifically around religion. So most studies show that presuming current birth rates and population trends and things like that, that by 2050, yes, what Nancy said earlier is there are more, more Christians than any other single religious group in the world right now, but by 2050, Islam will be very close. There will likely be about as many Christians as Muslims in the world. And by 2100, there will be far more Muslims than Christians in the world. And so that shift demographically is just, it's happening. But... Sorry about that. We might reconsider evangelism. <laughs> reconsider evangelism? Because <laughs> we're going to just stay small <laughs> otherwise. That's all right. It's all right. Then, then we'll band together. We but have a lot of kids, we can't. I do think, I was going to say, 
Christians have more babies. You know, that's uh, Episcopal evangelism is having babies. That's what we always say, right? Um, so what, what I do think that we have, it took you a minute to get that, didn't it? Um, what I do think is important, if you look at the landscape of faith in the world going forward, is that we really do stop pointing at differences between people of faith and realize that being a person of faith now and definitely in the future is going to become less and less common. And so we have even more reason to find understanding and trust, build all of that, work together, because people who do not ground themselves with a strong faith identity are ultimately more different than those who do. And I think that if we can seek that understanding and not lose ourselves, not lose the differences, that's, that's not the problem. The problem is misunderstanding our differences. If we can understand those differences better, then I think most of the time, we're actually gonna be seeking many of the same things, seeking peace, seeking justice, seeking kindness, seeking charity, protecting those who are most vulnerable. I mean, we all hold that in common. And I think more and more people who do not identify as faithful people don't exercise their actions in the same way. So I'm gonna, from a historical perspective, one of the greatest cop-outs, and you know, consider me biased, is that religion is, the mo is responsible for the most violence mm. in history. I do not believe that to be the case because I do not believe the Crusades were about religion. Right. I don't believe that ISIS is about religion. Right. I don't believe that the, uh, the genocide of the Rohingya Muslims is about religion. I don't believe that the Chinese persecution of the Uyghurs is about religion. These are political issues, economic and political issues that get window dressed with religion. And that's been the case historically and it's true today. Extremist groups uh, exist because of political circumstances. So when I, when I talk about ISIS, for example, like I, I, no one, you know, Muslims have been in Iraq for a very long time and people didn't pick up the Quran and decide that they're gonna start killing people. Uh, ISIS exists primarily because the entire country of Iraq has been destroyed. There is no infrastructure anymore. It's complete anarchy. And in the mosaic of militant groups and bandits and, and, uh, and other types of militias that have, that have developed, ISIS exists there. Imperialists will use religion historically for very evil means. That's because to an imperialist, nothing is sacred. Religion is merely a tool of imperialism. So I think that religion historically has been used for evil, but it was not the source of most of the evil that's taken place. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Rome, and we could go through the examples uh, that have marred and tainted all of the faith traditions. I mean, I don't believe that the Ku Klux Klan that uses a cross actually has anything to do with that cross, right? I, I think that I don't think there's anything about Christianity in there, and I, and I think that if the cross didn't exist, the Ku Klux Klan would burn something else. Right now, with that being said, when you when you mix religion with an evil political agenda, it becomes particularly combustible, and we have to acknowledge that. And oh, that's yeah. why it's important for us to push back on those interpretations, to uh, to rescue our religions from those that try to use it for evil means. Now, here's what I'm going to say, and, and and this is what I believe what we're doing here, which is special. I think that the idea that the only way to coexist is for each one of us to relinquish a bit of ourselves and our faith traditions so that we can be more uniform, I think that's deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. The more I believe in my Islam, the more I believe in the rights of my non-Muslim neighbor upon me. Mm -hmm. The more I believe in my religion, the more I believe in our humanity, right? And so discovering the purity of faith in a way that does not make us uniform but makes us truly united that forces us to coexist, not just by tolerating one another, but in a relationship of service to one another and to our broader society. I think that's special. And I think what we are doing here in Dallas, hopefully we can spread to different parts of the world. 
and we can serve as an example. We're not perfect here, uh, but I think that we're on to something. And I think that if we're able to really uh, move this forward, then hopefully we can teach other people around the world about what it means to truly love your religion, to believe in it even in the most orthodox sense while still having a deep sense of love for the person that lives next door to you that does not believe in your same faith tradition. When using tonight as an example of going beyond that, what I think you said is, is perfect. The clan uses a cross. Most of the people in this congregation know that's not Christianity. However, when non-Christian groups do something violent, we don't always know that is not their tradition. And it's the understanding and the exposure that is so critical, which is why I think something like tonight, although good, is hopefully just the inspiration to then do more, to get connected to people here in Dallas, to learn from each other, to learn what really the heart of these traditions are, so that then we are confident yes. that when someone does something in the name of a religion, that we know it is them doing that. That is not their religion. And I totally agree, you can look throughout history, even modern history, uh, Northern Ireland is a classic example of this. When surveyed, people in Northern Ireland before the peace treaty ranked religious identity as fourth on the list of what motivated them to hate the other. Now, we would say it's a lot of Catholic Protestant stuff because that's what was projected upon them, but that's not what motivated them. It was all politics. If we can, in this country, you are so much more likely to be hurt or even killed by someone born here who is white than you are by anyone else. And yet, we're very quick to see some white person who does something bad and know that that was not Christianity. That was a person who was sick. But then it happens that someone else outside the Christian church, outside the Christian group, or even outside America does something to hurt someone. And we don't necessarily make that distinction. And it's not being made for us because if it was being made for us, then we wouldn't watch 24 hour news and they couldn't sell commercials. And so the idea of making sure we are scared and making sure we are uncertain keeps us tuned in and it keeps the money flowing. We can do better than that. Excellent. We can spend time with each other and really understand that at the root of all these traditions is peace. And once we know that, then fear is taken out of the hands of the people who seek to manipulate us. And if I could say there, there was a... You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, I think a lot of people don't understand why Muslims are particularly allergic to calling a group like ISIS Islamic or using the term Islamic terrorism. Why are you giving a group who 98% of their victims are Muslim? 98% mm -hmm. of the victims of ISIS are Muslim. Why are you giving them that legitimacy that they crave so much? When you actually give in and you call, and a lot of Muslims, for example, you know, right now we have the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar, and uh, there's the term Buddhist extremists. Yes, the people that are ethnically cleansing Muslims in Myanmar are saying they're doing it in the name of Buddhism. I would never call them Buddhist extremists because never. I will not give them that legitimacy, that authority. I will never call the KKK a Christian group uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, an Islamic group, the Lord's Resistance Army in Central African Republic, a Christian group. They are the devil's army, right? There's no, we should not, we should not give these groups the legitimacy in our religions that they claim, especially when the majority of the victims of their religious persecution are usually people that belong to their same group. Absolutely. And I think that this is where the question here, or the, or the term understanding, what is understanding, right? What does it mean to really understand someone? There's a, a quote from, um, from Malcolm X who often is associated with hate, but he said something really beautiful when he came back from Mecca, 1964. He said, we need more light about one another. Light creates understanding. 
Understanding creates love. Love creates patience. Patience creates unity. And if you actually walk through that statement, light creates understanding. When we talk about building bridges of understanding, are we just talking about coming to the table and I have to accept the conclusions that you've already drawn unfairly about my faith and not have a chance to actually undo some of the misconceptions that you have because you think you've gotten them from a trustworthy source and you swear on your mother's grave that Tucker Carlson is telling the truth about Islam <laughs> and what he has said is, is fact and we must accept that. That's the same mistake that a Muslim who lives in the Muslim world that has never met a Christian will take, that every Christian is a colonialist and a crusader. Because, you know, ISIS uses the word crusaders. And they, they use that to describe American militarism. Here, it's civilization jihad. When you use words like that, you create, you already project a conclusion on another group of people. And so you rob that person of the right to represent themselves and their own terminology, their own epistemology, their own theology. If you really want to create understanding, then I have to be willing to sit at a table and do away with my, do away with my conclusions. It takes vulnerability to create understanding. You know what? Tell me what I don't know. Tell me what you, want to know, what you want me to know about you and know about your religion, know about your culture, know about your way of life. If we believe that human beings have been created in a way that's essentially good, where are you and why are you there? And tell me about yourself. I'm not going to force you to work within my moral framework or within my conclusions of you. I actually want you to represent yourself. Light creates understanding. When we learn to understand each other that way, we're able to love one another. When we love one another, we're patient with one another because we are understanding of each other's concerns and why people are in so much pain. And that patience creates unity. The only way we can get to that unity is not in the name of some meaningless, empty usage of the word peace. It's not gonna come through treaties. It's not gonna come through forced agreements. What it will come through is actually building bridges of understanding. I think you've um, jumped right into one of the questions from the gathering, which is what is the greatest challenge to interfaith relationships? So part of it is creating that understanding and that opportunity, but is there more that is the challenge to building an interfaith understanding or a way of being? Um, what is it that keeps us apart? I, I remember last year after this panel, a year ago, what I heard most often at the reception were from people who attended who are not Christian, who were so surprised to be treated well here. Hmm. And on the one hand, I'm so glad they felt they were treated well here. But on the other hand, that they would have shown up here not expecting to be treated well is unfortunate because I think in essence, we all sort of suspect that someone from outside our tradition is either doesn't really want to know us or worse, that they are afraid or going to judge us or actually dislike or hate us. And that's a big barrier because that could be true. L listen, I, I know plenty, I hear plenty of Christian leaders, some in this city, who are ugly. And I get that impressions of Christians can be pretty bad because I watch many Christian people on TV and I don't like them either. And so, you know, I might love them because I'm supposed to, but <laughs> don't like them. And I think that if we could perhaps jump the hurdle to know that people likely do want to know, well, what I really want to say is let's start from the place that people want to know each other. I don't know if that's true. I want it to be true. I really do want for us Echo to believe that. 
But maybe that's not. And maybe we can do better. No, I think, look, echo chambers are very comfortable. It's comfortable to have someone paint your entire world for you through your TV screen or your computer screen and then accept all of that and live your life thinking that you've got it all figured out and you've got everyone else figured out because those, that set of conclusions has been customized for you to make you comfortable, complacent, and, you know, uh, at the same time, you know, it allows us to not take responsibility for ourselves. It's like baby food. You don't have to work at it. Well, yeah, but I think there are some other things, too. I mean, I think yeah. that in Dallas, um, one of the challenges is that Muslims and Jews are a very small minority. And they're, you know, it's just hard for us to, you know, sometimes for us, there to be enough of us even to get, to reach the kinds of, um, numbers of Christians that there are in our community. And, and by the way, there are other religious groups in our yes. city as well, not just Christians and Muslims. But, um, you know, what I'm finding is that people are coming together over, uh, around issues. I, I, you know, hmm. one of the challenges right now is we're all isolated from each other. It's not only what we hear when we're in our echo chamber, it's that you know, we're being sort of socialized to be in echo chambers right. we're, and to be isolated from people. And we feel lonely. And so when we feel lonely, we gravitate toward people who make us feel comfortable and who we don't have to grapple with and, and who don't cause us. I mean, the other thing is, I think sometimes people don't enter into these conversations because they feel like they don't know enough about their own tradition mm -hmm. to be able to be knowledgeable enough to enter into the conversation. Mm -hmm. sure. And I think that's a big barrier that... Um, you know, that we face. So, you know, I think part of it is just um, starting with asking as many questions about our own faith and what it means to us and where and what it causes us to do as asking other people about it. You know, first we have to start with, you know, with our own, reckoning with ourselves and being um, brave enough to, to ask those questions and take the time, you know, to do it. That's okay. good. I think... Um, Look, getting to know someone who you've been taught to believe is inherently out to get you. It takes a lot of courage on your part. Um, one of the things that these groups are doing, that these media outlets are doing, that in our politics is happening, is that you are being, you, you said, socialized to think that you can't trust anyone's niceness because there is an agenda at play. So if someone, if someone acts different from what we told you they're supposed to act like, which is utter barbarians, then that means that's because they want to take over and subject you to their barbarity, but they're just, they're just playing it low-key right now. That, that's the same. Wasn't that used against the Japanese? Wasn't that used against the Jews in America? That, wasn't that used against Catholics? It's used, it's such a, it is so comfortable, so easy, so low, so cheap, so lazy to just say, no matter how they act, just know that they really have this nefarious agenda. And that, that's something that we have to have the courage to overcome. It takes a lot of vulnerability to talk to someone and to admit that you don't know anything about them and to be courageous enough. Because, you know, you mentioned we have to know about our own faith traditions. And that's, I think what it is, is that sometimes there's an insecurity. If we, if we mingle too much, we might lose ourselves. Mm. You know, if, if, if we talk too much to other people, then what's going to happen to our core identity? I'm, I'm not sure I can enter into a conversation. That means that you have an insecurity. And so it takes being secure with yourself to be able to truly sit and appreciate the other. And when it comes to interfaith, I'll say this, you know, I've had... Um, I've been a part of a lot of interfaith dialogues, as I'm sure we all have. And we are grateful that you yeah, are. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that can happen, we can remain at the level of dialogue. And it can become very, you know, we call it kumbaya, which is just, let's all hold hands, sing kumbaya, we're all the same. Let's not talk about our differences. Let's not mention the differences because we're, we're not going to be able to deal with those. It might get awkward. It might get uncomfortable. Here's the thing. Is interfaith really about embracing our differences or is it embracing each other despite our differences? 
And I think that's the, that's the nuance that we have to have when we come to these places. And not just embrace each other despite those differences, but then show how my being a Christian, my being a Jew, my being a Hindu, my being a Buddhist, and then of course in my case, my being a Muslim, makes this place better, makes our world better. How we can actually form coalitions around uplifting causes that we can agree are a part of who we are, rooted in our scripture, rooted in our being. I wanted to share this with you all because this is something you won't hear in the news. There were six mosque attacks in the two months after Donald Trump's inauguration as president. In January, as we sat here, yep. the next day there was a mosque that was bombed yep. in, you know, <laughs> in Texas. Mm -hmm. Yesterday in Katy, there was a gunman that opened fire on a mosque and drove off. In Katy, Texas, you don't hear about that stuff. That's the cost of hate, and we saw it in Pittsburgh, in that synagogue. There's a lot of programming that goes into a person before they walk into that church in Charleston, or that synagogue in Pittsburgh, or that mosque in Quebec, and murder a bunch of people. There's a lot of programming there. And one of the things I asked one of those protesters, because we got those armed protesters that show up to our mosques, self-proclaimed white supremacists that hold their guns and hold up their, you know, their Confederate flags and come in front of our mosques. I, asked, I just asked one guy one time, I said, you know, did you ever think about actually walking into the mosque without your gun and talking to us before you decided to come outside the mosque and hold your big old rifle and yell at little children? Did you ever think maybe, just maybe, I'm wrong? Let me walk into a mosque and talk to people. So that apprehension that you mentioned that a non-Christian might feel when they walk into this church, I wanna invite all of you to actually come to our mosques. Just walk in. I promise you, you won't be hurt. <laughs> um, you will be welcomed. And please know that uh, you, will be, you will be shown love, much like the love that's been shown to everyone as they came to this church. So you're making me... You're making me want to ask you to be a little vulnerable, all of you, because I think one of the differences that you'll <clears throat> model for us is what is it about your faith that you cherish the most? And so can you be vulnerable and share that in, in whatever ritual, practice, belief, teaching, years, history, but what is it that you just cherish? It's sort of the heart of your Muslim identity, the heart of your Jewish identity, the heart of your Christian identity. Wow. Well, I think about a passage from our morning prayer service that says that um, every day and every moment God is creating the world anew. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, creation is an ongoing process and our role is to open our eyes, to, to learn, to allow ourselves to be enlightened by what's happening in every moment and, um, and to be shaped and changed and not to be afraid to be changed by, the, by change, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be changed by change. You ready, Chris? You look like you're in deep yeah. thought. You better not pull out another show reference, TV show. I'm not ready for that. Please. Mrs. Maisel, maybe? <laughs> so I would say, look, for me, I actually, I had a, a conversion process of sorts. So I have an uh, interfaith family. Um, you know, my mom grew up in Bethlehem. And so we have Palestinian Christians and Muslims on my mom's side. And uh, I did have the opportunity as a teenager to really dive in scripture. Um, I met several Christian pastors and several rabbis, and one of the people I met in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was Jimmy Swaggart, who told me I was going to hell. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I left with an appreciation of people so I can appreciate how people had their own journeys. So that's one thing that, one of the reasons why I feel so blessed to be in companionship. I just love meeting people that are sincerely devoted to their faith in a way that doesn't make them a jerk. It's, it's so refreshing when you see someone that is truly a devoted Christian, a devoted Jew, a devoted whatever, and it doesn't make them a jerk. 
It, it actually makes them a good, wholesome person with some set of consistent principles and morality and, and decency. Like that to me is special. I value that. For me personally with Islam, uh, Islam has a great sense of clarity. It's, it's very clear in its concepts. It's very pristine. So the concepts of, of Tawheed, of monotheism, and what monotheism means, the concepts of, 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 of justice, which are very near and dear to me. I mean, justice is something that I was oriented with growing up. I had a humanitarian family. Uh, Malcolm was asked one of what, what he valued so much about Islam. He said how explicit the anti-racism scripture was. Like, you didn't have to extrapolate from passages on equality. You, there are scriptures about you know, the last speech of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was that there's no superiority over, of an Arab over a non-Arab or a white over a black. Those, those scriptures on gender equity, those scriptures on economic equity and, and, and anti-exploitation. Uh, I did a series, which I'd invite all of you to, to, to actually view online, called 40 Hadith on Social Justice. Uh, hadith is a prophetic tradition in Islam, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and 40 Hadith on Social Justice. It just covers everything from racism to animal rights to environmental rights and it's so explicit and clear and to me that really spoke to me uh, the clarity of belief the clarity of principles and uh, how 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 the prophet muhammad peace be upon him himself was so devoted to those things and you could see it in his own life and that was that was something that that spoke to me as well and, and looking at the examples of the prophets i often say this that um, you know, uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's a blessing to be able to look at the lives of Moses, peace be upon him, and Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Abraham, peace be upon him, and Maryam, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh, all of these found in our Quran, and draw inspiration from their steadfastness in very clear beliefs steadfastness and part of the steadfastness came from the clarity of vision and the clarity of belief. So that, that, that's my, been my faith journey. <clears throat> you know, when you dress like this, people often feel, one of two things happen. Either they repel um, and just turn the other way or they feel like they need to confess something to you. <laughs> Um, and so oftentimes people will confess that they have not been to church for a while. And I regularly say, well, we're in the redemption business, so come on back. But I think that's probably what I think is most precious, is that I think at the root, lots of people talk about love, that's great, love is great, but I think that redemption is perhaps what I find most compelling, most important. And my favorite scripture passage is the very end of the Gospel of Mark where Jesus has resurrected and the women are there and they're stunned and they want to run back and tell the apostles what has happened. And the, the witnesses who are there at the tomb say, go tell the disciples and Peter that he has gone ahead of you. And I remember reading that for the first time and thinking, why and Peter? Except Peter is the one who explicitly denied him. You know, when Jesus was most vulnerable and being most poorly treated and was about to be put to death, Peter, who was the rock, who was the number one, who could have at least had the integrity of claiming him, did not, denied him. And so upon the resurrection, the message is very clear. Go tell the disciples and Peter that he's gone before you. So no matter what we do, nothing can separate us from the love of God that God's love is complete and everlasting, total. And that, I think, is perhaps the most, the beautiful thing for me because we are so messy and we make mistakes all the time. And I, I grew up Roman Catholic and one of the things we always had to do was go to confession before all the big feast things. And of course you go into confession and I was a really good kid and 
I didn't do anything. I mean, I was boring. <laughs> and so I would have to make stuff up when I go into confession. And I would, you know, I would, I would say something, you know, whatever. I, was, I probably talked back and I was mean to my sister and that sort of stuff. You were watching and Sex so, in the City. Not that time. <laughs> so, but I remember, you know, we would, we would get out of confession and of course you almost had this matrix, right? So you do this bad thing and then the priest would say, well, go say three Our Fathers and ten Hail Marys. And it was sort of like, this much sin equal this many prayers and then you're good. And I would do that and it never really made too much sense because in a moment we then stray again. We're just, we're human. And whether it's what we think or what we do or what we say, it's always imperfect. And yet God's perfection surrounds us all the time. And we are told again and again and again to come back. That we may turn away from God, but God never turns away from us. And that redemption is constant and always present. And I think that's, that's always stuck with me. That's great. Thank you all for being so vulnerable in that. I think um, we're, we're drawing nigh, so I have a last question for you all, and it's really just an opportunity. Um, what haven't I, we, asked you that you wanted to make sure you were able to share this evening, that you wanted to make sure we heard from you? Well, I mean, I guess what's weighing on my mind, I look around this room, and I've been in some other rooms this week uh, up here in North Dallas, and I guess, you know, how does our um, connection as people of faith uh, going to impact the divides in our city, which are not so much faith divides as divides of um, race and opportunity and um, way of life. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's a big question that, that we could try to start, you know, I think people are starting to try to answer that and it's a big one. Similarly, I don't want this to be enough for you. I don't want this to be enough. It, it's so nice, and I'm glad you came, and I hope things stick, but I hope that action follows the thinking. Because you are so needed. We are all needed to take action and to actually affect change for the good. And so don't be satisfied with being a good person and coming on a Thursday night to an interfaith panel. It's just not enough. And take this and go do something different. Do something different in the next week or month. Don't put it off because you won't do it. So leave tonight, make a choice, go act differently. And maybe that's go meet a person that you don't know, but that you might suspect has a different faith tradition than you and have a conversation. Go sit in a Starbucks somewhere, you're gonna see somebody. And then you can just grab them and scare them and want to, <laughs> want to know more about them. But, but do take action because it's, it's so needed. Too many people are passive. Too many people think that they cannot make a change, that they are not important, that they are insignificant to go up against whatever negative, dangerous, fearful stuff is out there. And you are not insignificant. You are not too small. You have power in you. And you can go and spread this in such a meaningful way that our future can be brighter than our yesterday. So, um, I guess I'd start off with a note to Muslims, don't go to Starbucks because <laughs> <laughs> we're watching. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to try to stick to this note um, because it, it is something that I think is very important to us. You know, we talk a lot about privilege and we talk about um, urgency and, and you just mentioned the North and South Dallas thing. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make is we always wait until we cannot afford disunity or we cannot afford to be ignorant 
to try to unite and to try to come to know about one another. And maybe we wait too long because we have restricted the definition of peace to calmness in my life and in my circle. So for example, if I have peace in North Dallas, then there's peace, no matter what's happening in South Dallas. If I have peace in my life, in the sense of calm, then the poverty that exists outside of my life is not a disruption of that peace. Therefore, I don't feel compelled to strive for peace. If we have peace in America, in our country, and I really want us to think about this for a moment, because I think that 9-11 shook us up and every mass shooting shakes us up as it should shake us up. And I think that I would hope that we recognize in a time when our government is literally dysfunctional, when our society is this deeply polarized, when things are this bad that we can't afford to wait anymore. One of the things that I like to push back on is to say, that was there truly peace before 9-11? Was there peace before mass shootings became a daily norm? Is my peace disturbed by being conscious of the lack of peace that exists in other parts of the world, sometimes due to the bad foreign policy of my government? Is that on my conscience? I'm disturbed by the lack of peace that that child has at the Tijuana-San Diego border. I'm disturbed by the lack of peace that that child in Yemen has. I'm disturbed by the lack of peace that the child in South Dallas has. My conscience does not allow me to have peace even if the effects of that lack of peace aren't showing up on my doorstep. I'm disturbed. So when we talk about peace, when we talk about justice, you know, there's a saying that justice can't be just us only about us, only about our lives. If we truly want to expand our hearts, we have to expand our worlds, and we have to expand our view of the world, mm -hmm. and we have to expand the burdens that we are willing to take upon our expanded hearts because we believe in scripture that calls us to that expanse, and a humanity that that scripture is supposed to speak to that calls to that expanse. And so don't always wait for something to show up on your doorstep. And that's what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., probably the most appropriated figure in the history of the United States, most celebrated yet neglected, said that peace is not the absence of tension, but it's the presence of justice. So long as injustice persists, inequity persists, and I have something that I can do about it and I don't, then I need to push myself to do a little bit more, even if that lack of justice is even to my benefit. Privilege has responsibility. All of us have some layer of privilege. What are we doing with that privilege to benefit those that have been robbed of it? Or do we only wait until it becomes too violent, too tense for us to be able to persist in our own, in our own privilege? So make yourself uncomfortable before you get uncomfortable. Yes. That's what I'm actually trying to say. Make yourself uncomfortable because there's too much discomfort that's out there that we're called to heal. And I think that that's how we set ourselves apart, I would hope, is that we actually live our scriptures in healing the world around us. And that starts with South Dallas. So. Amen. I believe we have a reception to attend. That's Thank right. you all. Thank you Thank all. You all. Thank you all.